Hello everyone, today we talk about Leopold of Habsburg's uh, abandonment of Vienna in 1683, the events that surrounded the situation, you know, how the thing proceeded, and the general feeling right, of despair and of you know, surprise and almost incredulity in front of the, the events. This is part of this broader series we're making on the let's say the Ottoman Wars, but specifically about uh, the 1683 siege of Vienna. At some point we will have also to make a video to, to explain a bit why I decided this, because it's not so, you know, banal as it seems. And we're looking at this event in, uh, you know, essentially second modern history to uh, realize certain aspects, especially in, in, in a moment of transition between really an early to, to a late modern phase. Um, and both in times and spaces here, but anyhow, the Turk in encamped right here for today. We we skip the Grand Guignol mm, style, you know, atrocities that were carried out from from both sides in, during the invasion, and more or less focus on the on the imperial perspective, because the emperor began to assume those measures of of emergency to defend the capital while he was ordering the celebration of continuous sessions of rites and prayers, uh, disposing that would be also resumed this usage of the Turkenglöckern, so the, uh, basically the, the, the chimes, of all uh, Vienna's bells and you know, also the ones of the surroundings every morning to alarm the population. For the rest he left anyhow to his collaborators the task to organize the particulars, of course the, the minor things, and he made this attempt to maintain and altered his own habits. This might have been also a political move action from the, the situation was deteriorating rapidly, right, and he, as you know, as we've seen many times, he passes from this mostly kind of um, depressive mm, melancholic, dark, introverted figure that was, you know, rightfully uh, anxious of the situation, but surely he had also uh, a control and certain actions were ha have to be read in that specific context where there wasn't really much more to do, right? Um, and these habits included the, the hunting parties in the reserve of uh, Pachtolstorf, where he went um, in summer between the, the 2nd and the 6th of July, uh, the moment in which the Ottomans were basically at a few mile, um, a few miles from there, and already from the top of uh, Vienna's walls, the f flames of the burning villages could be could be, could be spotted. So, hunting was one of the great passions, as you know, of princes and noblemen of, of the time. And after all, Leopold shared um, it with all that uh, you know. That we, together with that figure that was at the moment his direct adversary was the same Mehmet the Fort. We've we've seen it in other videos that also organized these hunting parties in trays, where basically you know he depopulated the entire family. The, the Ottomans were a bit you know megalomaniacal about you know this show of power. There, there were hunting parties in the Ottoman Empire were literally military campaigns, and obviously the thing was was connect were connected right you know um, since the dawn of, of hunting in, in a sense but this is something we skip but in, in his preachings father Abraham a Santa Clara as we will see later who he was doesn't didn't hesitate to whip violently this um, unregulated passion of Leopold that um, and, uh, and and the Austrian nobility in general that pushed often the noblemen to let the, the the boars that were being chased destroyed the uh, the fields and the uh, vineyards of those poor peasants that they would have <laughs> otherwise uh, paternally protected and that instead they um, brought under you know ever more the, the hardest and also illicit corvée uh, in this regard and a criticism towards the excessive passion of hunting also came from uh, from the same, the, the most, let's say, mod uh, modest and sober milieu of, of the nobility, 
um, of which uh, of whom exactly in those years best expression was the treatise uh, Adeliges Landleben of Wolf Helmhardt von Hornberg. It was documenting this more, you know, uh, proposing this more modest uh, way of life. And hunting was hunting was a service of power. Um, it was a military training, a privilege, um, a pastime, an entertainment, naturally. And not surprisingly, the treatises um, uh, approach, let's say, parallel it since Middle Ages to war and love. Mm -hmm. um, and in, not surprisingly, it, it was uh, during the uh, the Grand Siècle. Uh, Mars, Venus, and uh, Diana, the uh, divinities that were more often represented in the sculptures of princely and nobiliar gardens, uh, this neoclassical style. And um, it's not even in this case, you know, we don't have to think that for Leopold going hunting was in that frantic moment a, you know, a way to distract himself from the situation, to escape reality and uh, his worries. Um, hunt, um, especially horse riding, hunting requires tension, attention, uh, concentration. So in its own way it's an ascetical activity. Uh, the, 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 the wild animal that is being hunted, that could be a bear, uh, a deer, a boar, uh, whatever, um, is mm, fundamentally enjoying contemporary two different symbological statuses. It's friend and brother, brother in arms, let's say a comrade, an initiator. Mm -hmm. and we've seen this in the series about uh, animals medieval in, yeah, in the medieval imaginary, right, and all the uh, kind of uh, ambiguity, let's say the warrior that takes from the animal but also that fights against the animal such uh, and can be killed. It's a test, it's an initiatic rite. So then the animal is also a mortal enemy in this case, a figura diaboli in Christian in Christian imagination. Um, so the emperor could well imagine a duel between him and his boar um, to hunt as the image of the next clash with the Turk, but you know, who was the chaser, who was the prey there because the situation was surely pretty dramatic uh, from the Habsburgic side, but also the Ottomans were making a, a dramatic effort from, from a strategical, logistical point, political point of view, as we have seen also in, in the other series after the failure of, of 1683. Um, the Ottoman Empire was engulfed in civil strife, it was a mess happened. And on July the 7th came through certain uh, relays news um, that were, after all, kind of unexpected, and in front of which it seemed that the situation was, you know, falling apart, uh, deteriorating pretty rapidly. In fact, the Tartar uh, raiders had been spotted very close to the city uh, from uh, more points of uh, the south of Vienna. It was possible to look at the columns of smoke of the burning villages, and in the meanwhile, the Ottoman army that everybody, you know, believed um, to be affected by a sort of pachydermic uh, slowness uh, wa had come to Mozon, where the, uh, the, this is in Hungary today, where the, the Leita uh, River, that's the traditional border between Hungary and Austria, flows into, into the Danube. So they were coming straight to Vienna uh, from the south. So in this frantic read of new, of con also also contrasting news, as you can imagine, were brought by a courier after the other. Um, uh, Leopold decided that uh, it was it wasn't right that for the, the imperial family and the Aufkriegsrat to uh, let themselves be bottled for who knows how long in the besieged city. And to confuse the news, there was also the, the colonel uh, Leopoldo Filippo Montecuccoli, who was son of the great uh, Raimondo, uh, that um, at this point, um, you know, you understand here, Leopold and Philip as two 
pretty hard sounding aspergic names when you speak of loyalism and 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 uh, fidelity so in this situation probably leopold evidently felt more uh bored than than hunter and in fact on july the 7th it was a wednesday the situation seemed to crumble apart uh suddenly in fact um, news spread that the Turks had uh, crossed unexpectedly bridges and fordings, uh, deep bridges and fordings that still separated them from Vienna, and it was uh, also acknowledged uh, the you know the, the event of a d disgraceful clash that had occurred in Petronel, um, albeit we're not really sure where around the area as you know is kind of kind of large which uh, cavalry and dragoons of the rear guard of the duke of lorraine had been uh, you know clumsily surprised by the uh, tartar raiders and they had uh, undecorously escaped chased by their general commander that hit them with the butt of the pistol shouting uh, uh, gentlemen, you dishonor the arms of the empire, and um, the it's probable that this indignant and heartfelt reminders um, were expressed in a kind of a less <laughs> gentle uh, uh, terminology. And Ludwig William of Baden that found it was um, the son of Louise Christine of Savoie Carignano who was born in Paris in the Hotel de Soissons in the same so the same house in which also his cousin Eugene of Savoy had uh, uh, and we in fact talked about him back in the day well he uh, found himself uh, on the spot almost by chance with a cavalry unit and managed to uh, maintain uh, his men information but he couldn't really do much more and in that clash was badly wounded also the young commander of a regiment of dragoons Louis Julius of Savoie Soissons that would die um, some day later and his brother Eugene would have in a short while uh, honorably vindicated his memory so much that the name of Louis Julius is also uh, Prince Ludovic is in also in the song of Prince Eugene, uh, Prince again, again the uh, Rita, and um, in the last stanza, which is not because that talks about the the, the siege, uh, the, the Battle of Belgrade, right? But that is 1717. So in the in the in the song you have actually this presence. Uh, of Ludwig dying uh, in the in the, in the clash, even though that had happened 34 years before, so that tells how much also Eugene was was uh, I mean his brother's death, how much marked his life at the end of the day, how how deeply oh, this that that chapter of the the, the Austrian expansion eventually the uh, damage of the Ottoman Empire and the the, the rise to the rank of a proper power uh, actually uh, owes to this actually insignificant clash that happened uh, in, in around Petronel in 1683 and the death of the, the young Savoie Soissons. So it was at this point General Caprara and the colonel Montecuccoli to bring to Vienna the news of this military route that doesn't matter how modest it was it had caused a true panic and to make the emperor decide that it was that the moment had come properly to leave the capital uh, if he didn't wish to remain bottled in it and the official communication from the side of Charles of, of Lorraine that described the emergency of the situation was brought to the sovereign by the Italian general Rodolfo Rabat and also uh, the according to the Dragoman Tarsia, the Dragoman was this in major interpreter that you know uh, refers of the happenings of, of in the Christian camp according to the perspective of the news that came from uh, in, into the Ottoman one. Mm -hmm. um, the 
and the competent uh, advice of the Duke of, Do of Lorraine was decisive to induce uh, Leopold to take the ungraceful decision. And in fact we have here the text proper from Tarsia that says the Duke of Lorraine having left his camp that he uh, held close to Ra the Rab uh, entrenched as had been saying brought himself hastily in Vienna according to what was uh, referred to advise his Caesarian Majesty of the formidable um, I would say you know mass of, of, of the Turks against the imperial city so that unexpectedly with some surprise his imperial majesty uh, would not remain blocked in it so that in virtue of the this uh, what was referred by the same duke was, was deliberated this decision and after two days before the disappearance of the uh, excuse me of the appearance actually of the first vizier in the campaigns of in in the countryside of Vienna um, uh, followed precipitously the uh, the escape the of of the the leave of the emperor the empress and the nobility of of all the court with the prescription um, in the same way to all the inhabitants that, as we will see, w wouldn't abandon altogether the city. Uh, many would remain, and actually the, the city was still filled mostly by all the refugees coming from, from the countryside. Um, but it says here, both the foreigners as much as the citizens of the same, not having, in fact, provision for six, um, provision for six months of food, to go away from the city and bring themselves somewhere else. And that um, those of the Berg also could not be um, included, could not be admitted within the the city, if not with the same clauses, um, because of course they they needed the food for the army. So the more people remained, to, I mean, to defend the city. So the more people remained in the city, the more logistical problems. And the problem is that these people had also, where do you go? But many left, as we will see, and therefore, for throughout all Vienna, spread the fatidic shout: "The Turk is at the gates!" And um, this brought naturally an unrefrainable disorder in the city. The emperor, with all the family in the court, together with the nuncio Bonvisi and the principal authorities, left uh, the capital, escorted by Caprara who, by the way, came back in, in eventually into besieged um, Vienna. He guided his own regiment under the supreme command of the Duke of Lorraine, uh, valorously participated the head of two dragoon regiments to, to the Battle of September the 12th, and eventually uh, on uh, on October the 9th of the one of Barkan. Right, and after the free uh, the freeing of Vienna, he he um, he would be appointed as Feldmarschall. Right, and uh, definitely he had solicited enough uh, and repeatedly the, the appointment to, uh, to, s to t s this rank, such rank, uh, to say the least. And he would go on to, you know, uh, as we have seen also in the Prince Eugen series, how, you know, as one of the generals of the empire in the answering campaigns against the Ottomans in Hungary and so on, and in Belgrade and so on. And um, and uh, in this situation, uh, let's say Leopold's left, if not um, really hot foot, right, as many have written, let's say, at least with a certain, you know, uh, solerge, I would say, to uh, settle in Linz, that is 217 kilometers, roughly, uh, up a river, uh, up up the river Danube. So, um, also hastily, fervently, had been brought together for this uh, uh, travel uh, the treasure, the courtly archives, the famous Caesarian library, right? That had still not been sent before. Right? When in the late in late afternoon, the news of the the imperial leave 
spread to which surely didn't ha help to, to, to generate more health right and this was th this um, news were accompanied naturally with with by great mm, bad mood and even but with some protest from from the side of, of the Viennese people because they say you know what the hell are you leaving us right now um, but it was objectively the right thing to do and the Imperial um, let's say court uh, was restricted let's say uh, for this travel so not all the court properly left but it, it still you know counted uh, 69 coaches 32 heavy carts 391 horses for the sovereign then uh, 30 alone right and then 33 coaches 22 heavy wagons carriages and 203 light ones for the refugees of princely rank right so the uh, there was also a military escort of 200 horsemen because literally the Tartars as we will see were spreading all over right the Ottoman army was like a, a pretty well defined bulky thing but imagine all around gravitating these swarms of Crimean Tartars that they had called uh, from from the Ukraine and even beyond um, and that simply literally laid waste everything they, they found in the front or, or at least they they looted and pillaged it because that's how the Ottomans paid them at the end of the day and this would infiltrate every freaking where because of mobility and given the let's say hasty and surely also improvised character of this leave it seems we can understand a bit maybe for for excessive optimism a bit for understandable um, uh, I would say real reluctance the Emperor had up to th that very point procrastinated the preparations because he was convinced that there would have been no need to leave Vienna uh, or that it, he might have not actually wanted to leave it for at any cost or for any reason because that's the, the, the you know the firmness we were talking about before that was the the center of the Habsburgic dominions it was a matter of you know uh, of, of, an, of international importance that he was the Emperor the Holy Roman Emperor it was a huge um, you know expectation from and, and of course he knew that and he probably did his best to belate this this leave so uh, 20 years before when the Ottomans were stopped at the Battle of Saint Gotthard um, the Everything had, you know, been, I mean, all these worries about the invasion had been there, but Montecuccoli defeated the guys on the Rab, so the Ottomans didn't simply arrive. Um, and therefore, the, there had been a certain optimism still by 1683, uh, because there was a party of the, you know, almost those who were in deniers, there was specifically the, the Spanish party at court that, you know, still hadn't learned what had happened 20 years before when it hadn't been the Ottomans defeated on the Rab, Vienna would have fallen because it, it absolutely didn't have the defense that, that that it had now by 1683 also because of what had happened in fact back in the day. So um, there was some surely incompetence also in some uh, parts of the court but not, not necessarily invested the leadership there. So um, we don't know what Leopold was was thinking at that point. Was he, you know, overwhelmed at the last moment by a motion of terror, or did he actually give up in front of all the insistence that we're starting not just to be energic, but also very motivated, given that the Ottomans were at the gates, uh, or they would have been in a while. So the the travel knew also some dramatic moment that reveals how risky the situation had become for the same imperial family because in Krems on the Danube so it's very close to Vienna if you know the area um, uh, it, it, they, actually the imperial uh, the court met along the way with with some Tartar raiders right and that had occupied the opposite bank of the river but they didn't assail the long very long as we've seen convoy right so maybe the Tartars didn't realize that 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 was the Emperor and his family um, however 
it seems that it was thanks to the uh, the firmness, the uh, rapidity uh, of the uh, French ambassador Sebeville, right, that uh, had the bridge uh, blocked by his his serfs. If uh, you know, at least a, a, a skirmish, uh, a skaramouche would have been avoided. But you know, probably even worse because we don't know what if the Tartars had gotten the upper hand at that point, whether they, they could have even um, killed or kidnapped the the emperor and his family. Would you understand how you know reckless this this thing was? And the figure of Sebeville is very fascinating because you know he was this French diplomat that was living through hell at that point because uh, in in the imperial following. Of course, everybody was talking bad about the Sun King that, of course, didn't give a damn about what was happening or better. You know, he was hoping for for the for the Austrians to receive a heavy blow. And uh, his, generally speaking, his fellow Turkish attitude and, and in fact, were throwing to Sebeville that was, just, you know, just a, an ambassador, uh, this, this venom stray, right, you know, and uh, asking him, for, for example, as a provocation, uh, news on Ottoman forces, uh, given that he surely knew, according to them, something about them. And Sebevi himself actually cared very much to let us know that he always answered, you know, the right way to this, to this mocking without letting himself be intimidated. And, and naturally, the diplomatic messages were ciphered, but they, uh, they were also able decryptators um, at, at the time so that everything was spied and read and known in a way uh, or or another. The journey however continued through the way of Melk uh, towards Linz uh, that uh, you know, eventually would lead the Imperial family as we've seen in other videos on by boat up to Passau that was further 80 kilometers west um, and this decision was maybe hasty but reasonable right but it wasn't definitely easy to take from a political point of view you know um, it was not too you know skillfully translated in, in practice um, even though it was not so disorderly as somebody was you know was claiming for tendentious reasons um, and definitely was unpopular because the emperor had left the city in fact the emperor himself uh, on when uh, he arrived in Passau on July the 18th had actually trusted me in, in, into a into a letter directed to his spiritual counselor Marco Daviano to have been felt um, uneasy about this right but s such a step um, and um, in there, there is this moving ending in the letter that says I recommend to your paternity to Father Daviano all my own right all my own at my poor Vienna uh, and that gives you a bit the, the dimension of what what the moral side lean towards um, um, and also he he was himself actually complaining about the confusion and the negligence um, that had uh, existed in this in, in this leave um, and so on um, in the meanwhile the imperial infantry had entrenched within the Viennese walls while cavalry together with the Duke of Lorraine still remained around Pressburg, Bratislava, um, and contemporarily to the Emperor, or you know, uh, just after him, but um, in reality the exodus had already began from before and kind of in a scattered way. There were many thousands of people, in great part aristocrats, or at least members of the most prosperous classes, that giving the impression of um, every man for himself fundamentally um, and, and that um, were pushing you know just to 
to make the mills remain and all, all those that had no alternative right you know uh, were, were leaving so the houses left free were after all immediately occupied by in great part at least by a, a much greater number of inhabitants of the Viennese suburbs that flowed into the city walls um, uh, uh, of course, seeking for repairs, given that, you know, uh, you know how the siege fundamentally went. Uh, the Ottomans built a camp all around. Um, but in, in, in all the situation, as uh, rule uh, was fundamentally uh, sinking, in, in a sense, that there were episodes of sackings and vandalism, etc., uh, to which were added certain official confiscations from the side of the authorities that were organizing the defense and many among those that had fled um, were mm, de facto characters that could have remained to give the example right instead they basically left for example there was the primate of Hungary uh, uh, that was surely not the only one but I mean th this was a bro mm, political, moral, religious struggle. So um, many were, however, those that, albeit having an option, did remain, actually, in, in, at their place in the city. And whichever practical reasons were behind these choices as well, their presence um, sounded substantially as a, you know, as a tacit, but, but severe, reproachment towards the sovereign uh, that had instead left. So Leopold suffered very much of the weight of such decision to abandon the capital and also of the coping with the r voices of reproachment that with the, let's say, the heartfelt um, and um, or mm, affection, let's say, uh, or the ill-concealed or explicit malevolence were, were reaching him. And the court could not avoid to spread various justifications, among which there was actually no official one. I mean, formally, uh, it was a necessary prudential measure in order um, not to imprison the imperial government preventing him from acting differently eventually and and therefore in, in, in also in the primary interest of Vienna itself um, and however no motivation could be com convinced or com convincing and it was told for example that the emperor had to brought in safety uh, his uh, wife uh, Eleanor was about to give birth, uh, but the hypothesis that is still, you know, actual in that that mm, we we couldn't in fact um, eliminate completely is that the excessive proximity of the enemy had determined with, within the sovereign a reaction of of fear that, however, appears scarcely credible because. Um, given that we can, of course, we cannot rule this out from the world matter, we have to observe that in this way Leopold also subtracted himself objectively from, from the, to the theater of, uh, from the theater of operations in a way that would render uh, easier the settlement of, of a military command, of, a, of the headquarters of, of the army, right, throughout all the period. Of, of the siege and also you know of the king of Poland that as we know had been finally you know was being convinced fundamentally to intervene and the the chance in fact was immediately uh, uh, collected uh, because with precise tempestivity Talenti wrote uh, to Cardinal Barberini that uh, at this point um, because he was the nuncio from from Warsaw right that um, and nothing uh, at this point diplomatically was interposing between the, the recognition of Jan Sobieski to become the uh, the commander in chief, right? You know, 
uh, together, at least with the Duke of Lorraine. Um, and um, uh, he was promising, you know, that, that the King of Poland was, uh, I mean, would immortalize himself and in, in, in make miracles and so on. So besides this, um, we also don't have to underestimate other uh, good political and dynastic reasons that surely the emperor might have taken into consideration in order to take the, on this painful and embarrassing decision. Because aside from his person, which is not a few, and uh, his uh, th um, pregnant third wife, there were two sons, right, the heirs, the sickly uh, six years old Leopold that would die uh, as a kid, and, and the five years old Joseph would become Joseph the first. We met him in the last Prince Eugen video, you know, when he was crowned in Aug Augsburg. And that was a hell of a of a ruler. He died prematurely as well, but you know, uh, he surely uh, is considered as as one of the most effective uh, Habsburgic uh, leaders. Had he lived on, might have achieved uh, even Prince Eugen would would have actually received much more support for his military enterprises. Um, therefore, um, the imperial family could not risk. Uh, the life of even uh, literally uh, actually the, the survival of the the Habsburgic dynasty in Austria right but so uh, but also the Spanish branch of the dynasty was in crisis at the time so uh, this would have I mean endangering the kids would have brought to, to an enormous unbalancement in the European political order and of course, everything could have been better organized, more calmly, with m more orderly, but without leaving um, the, let's say, the disappointing, if not the despairing impression that Wu was witnessing this uh, would, have, would have understood as not as an act of reasonable withdrawal, but literally as an escape. Uh, also, we don't have to underestimate the influence of the members of the Spanish party that we were, we were hinting at before, that uh, up to the last instant had basically done everything to um, minimize the, the danger of the Ottoman advance, uh, coming almost to deny evidence. And for, for this, they had the Spanish party here because they, they, they would have preferred the Austrians to concentrate mostly on the French frontier, it was the Spanish interest of the time, so they, they were called like that, and they were saying, you know, basically the Ottomans, oh no, they're not really doing anything, yes, they're coming to besiege the freaking Vienna from, from Constantinople, one of the largest military operations in, in, in this period in history, and something, you know, gigantic, really, as an effort. Um, so, in, in, since naturally they had been triggered by their own uh, failure, they had actually accused at that point the Nuncio Bonvisi that instead, you know, hadn't lost any chance to manifest his worry for, for the Ottoman invasion. And after all, the Nuncio had opposed himself to that last moment leave that seemed to, too much similar to an escape, and he uh, accepted it at the end of the day, but remaining contrary to it, uh, because, however, he didn't want to abandon the emperor in such a dramatic moment. So, of all this, he would have written to Cardinal Sibo in Rome up some some week after in August, in August, without dissimulating his resentment. He said, quote, "I would like, with my discredit, not to have been um, a prophet of of, of prophet of doom that are." you know, uh, sovereign in us, but God has wanted for my greater, mm, you know, uh, sadness that uh, I could mm, actually foresee this doom without actually putting a remedy to it, because the most, uh, it say, the strongest faction party that was uh, terrified by the threats of a minister um, was more consonant to the Rhine than to the Danube, right? And the president of war, uh, so the theory is talking badly about the Spanish party that wouldn't wanted more intervene against uh, inter a Spurgeon intervention against France, was making believe to His Majesty to have in 
in hand the peace with rebels that were the Hungarians basically were supporting the uh, and it was accentuating so much the forces of the Turk that the uh, good emperor was flattering himself to make a war uh, the the offensive war so the one against France and no, and he didn't believe to me when clearly I was telling him it was showing him that he, c he couldn't even do the defensive one while uh, he was keeping mm, mm, the the people of his empire um, and he would have found himself uh, tricked um, deceived in the supposition that uh, they would have provided him with 80,000 men mm -hmm. because we have seen already in other videos how you know poor actually Habsburgic forces were at the beginning it was just basically by papal diplomacy that you know and, and money of course that the, the thing could be put together and even in there while the siege was progressing and things were you know really pretty going pretty grimly for for the Christians and and then he says and um, we have then seen the, the fraud and the inertia of those colonels that had been promoted by, by favor and therefore I persuaded uh, I tried to persuade the Emperor that they would um, you know that you know the Caesarian family you know, the Imperial family and and the most precious things that were in Vienna could be put quickly in in uh, in security but they uh, said that the infatuated by the destiny I was too ha hasty and that they were bolder right and that um, basically the, the the same people at the end of the day escaped more precipitously than others and uh, they but by having put the in, in manifest danger the, the the imperial family and um, having made remain important resources uh, within Vienna without essentially putting them in, into safety so fear was dominating at this point and the nuncio adds those inhabitants um, that um, aside from the advice of the you know brought by the Duke of Lorraine uh, they they were I mean they were here in paraphrasing skipping certain parts but I mean they had sense that things I mean that the Ottomans were coming so the situation was terrible and because they were seeing now all the air covered in, in a very dense smoke that seem, seemed like a terrible globe of flames caused by the great fires with which so many villages lands palaces and any other thing that the Turks met were you know were reduced to um, and um, so that mm, mm, people could dare in the countryside could barely escape um, because they would be exterminated by the Turks fundamentally um, and we have seen in one place uh, say I have seen in one place myself um, the day after uh, more than 100 corpses on the ground so you understand that at some point we will talk about that too because the the ferocity we addressed it here and there in some video but at some point we should explain what these clashes were about because what I was saying in the beginning of the video is that when we talk about the siege of Vienna in 1683 that there is always this sense that you know if you talk about it uh, you're somewhat a conservative that wants to, to express clash of civilization between Christians and Muslims uh, and or you know if you're a liberal you should say ah oh, no well it was soft it was nothing it was something like the other no this wasn't something like the other right you have to understand there were deep intersections and it, if you look at violences you, you realize that here now the Ottomans were having the upper hand if you look at the world out the Turkish wars, let's say, Westerners uh, versus the Ottomans, etc. You see a, a degree of ferocity that, yes, I do objectively think that the Ottomans were more used to at the beginning for many reasons, just because of their kind of right of Völker um, influence in a way, because literally we are talking about 
let's be honest, at, at least, you know, not properly the Ottoman Empire itself, but it, the, the substance of it was still composed by Arabs, were dramatically wilder and less civilized than Western Europe. So um, it was normal. It, then the Ottomans all had a political ideology that was very ferocious. There is also a different view of the same Islam in a way. It's, it's more... Um, you know, it had, makes less scruples about certain aspects, but the, the Christians began to imitate Ottoman ferocity in everything, everywhere, in Central Europe, in the Mediterranean, and it was normal, in a sense, and today we we say, oh wow, you know, these were crazy, that, no, it was like basically what humans do in those situations, and you can see it in so many other cultures throughout all history, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it sucks saying that, but it's kind of a universal way of dealing with uh, with war in, in, in certain circumstances, uh, in certain cu with certain cultural background, uh, etc. But we're talking about the 17th century, which we we tend not to realize how primitive it was compared to our own times, but still, you know, how in this sense logical it was, and we have to understand that logic in order to be understood, uh, to 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 to, ex excuse me, to, ex to express it, an historical judgment even about this kind of violence. Um, but continuing about the, the escape, we calculated that around 30,000 Viennese, that is mm, basically almost all the, those who had the possibility, evacuated the city, um, within which would have remained, however, around 70 to 80,000 people, because around 20,000, as we've seen, basically entered within the, I mean, the city from the the city rings the city ring proper from the countryside right and when the considered that the same defenders destroyed they they set on fire and raised to the ground the viennese suburbs so that they the, the ottomans couldn't you know basically entrench in them um and also the they were starting to to depositate victuals there so lots of people would actually flock in the city because they knew that the army had the foot part so um, it was a complex situation in the churches the preachers were raising their high their voice like it had already happened two centuries before um, and uh, and even some decade before when uh, I mean back in the day when the Franciscan John of Capistrano had called to you know had summoned the Christians for the Crusade of 1456, uh, as you know, with Belgrade, etc., with Dunyadi and so on. Um, and, and now, the hero of the war, let's say at the moment, was the Augustinian father Abraham a Santa Clara, that was an authentic um, uh, diva of penitence, uh, as it was called at the time. And the sermons of Vum shook the courts of princes, um, not less than the, the squares the holes and his ardent preaching incited uh, to naturally repent of sins and to um, and, and to make the conversio ad Christum proper being rediscovered right as the first and true uh, weapon against the barbarian and pagan invader right that would be summed up with what could be uh, known as the later title can sum up this, the, the slogan of 1683 Auf, Auf, ihr Christen mm -hmm. so stand up you Christians um, and this is um, you know uh, the, the, the uh, Auf with, with two F's by the way you know it's the antiquated form that you know in modern German it's just Auf with one, with one uh, F but I interestingly found it even back in the day, I don't know, before cavalry charges in the Middle Ages, uh, there was some shouts in, in the ranks by the Rottmeister saying, you know, Helm auf, Helm auf, because, um, uh, or Helm auf, actually, in uh, in Austria, in Middle Ages, in, uh, oh, well, okay, I should talk about that another time. Uh, as far as, you know, Father Habram instead was, um, uh, he was known as Santa Clara because he had taken vows in, the, in that instance, um, in in the, the Saint Clair um, name uh, or day, I don't remember the thing, but he was actually a Swabian, Johann Ulrich Megerle, hmm? uh, living from 1644 to 1709. 
and his scripts exist they're published so one can study them as well um, and uh, the um, aside from at least the, the beggars the or let's say the poorest people that were obliged to take refuse, uh, refuge in the city and to basically accept to be trapped by the enemy because they didn't know literally where to go. Uh, here consider, as we've seen, that the, the Tartars were swarming all around the countryside. So uh, Vienna was in many ways like you can't, couldn't go like, like in other places like go to Germany, go to Bohemia because you know, you're risking life concretely just to stay out in the first place there and where do you go actually as well um, when Prince again was coming to pass out where also Leopold already was you know did we know these columns of refugees bottling all the ways all this stuff but you know many from the surrounded poorest people didn't even know how to travel would naturally get in the city knowing that that could be taken and stormed by the Ottomans so that they would perish in it and of course they, they also knew that life in there was was terrible because of illnesses and um, and you know lack of food whatever uh, so we made a video actually on the appalling conditions in which they were living in Vienna during the siege um, so for them uh, the great gates of the city wall were crossed as kind of safety um, but there were also other interesting characters that are somewhat bizarre and and picturesque and and they are, they still express the uh, almost picaristic um, you know character 17th century Central Europe uh, in many ways um, um, and we we can't actually sum up all of them because some of their stories first of all are not clearly known others have been literally forgotten but in some fortunate case we can refresh their memory for example do, we'll talk about lots of Italians actually that were coming especially from the northeast from the lands like Friuli for example there was the Friulan nobleman Odorico Frangipan and that knowing that the Turk was uh, pressing on Vienna uh, left from Tarcento on June the 29th on the day of St. Peter and arrived to uh, in Vienna in uh, uh, on July the 11th right in time to be able to put his sword at the service of his emperor and however it, it went badly his family for him like his family was known for also heavy anti obsburgic positions so he had um, actually to spend the whole siege hiding himself in order to escape prison so basically he went to Vienna where he knew he could have been uh, you know recognized and arrested by the authorities because his family had been unloyal to the Emperor um, and yet just to fight against the Turks there so imagine you know so trying to hide himself from the same besieged kind of crazy right but that's how much the you know what I would like to stress here is the motivation that never have to underestimate that it. it's obviously political etc but it's all blended naturally also with fate with religion so these are difficult even properly difficult mindset to recreate because today we have to necessarily separate politics and religion and therefore it's one or the other right we have to accept it's both that it's it's you know there can't be usually it's like this from a conservative standpoint it's all about you know religion and the true thing that was at the time and the perfection which wasn't like that at all uh, liberals have to say no this was nothing to do with religion we're just a bunch of bastards that did this for whichever vicious reason no that's also not history it has nothing to do with it um, it was both uh, reasons political religious and all you know the other broader ones that you can find in the circumstances but that sh you know look at what this brought people to do it's not about even the reason actually but about the the intensity of the motivation that is astonishing right and this is still the great century of th this was a crusade probe right so um it, it never forget the 
the, the deep universal meaning that still existed was being diluted at the time, especially in, in lands like Central Europe, where it was still strong compared, I don't know, to France that was even allied with, with the Turks, but was still some of the most advanced countries out there, just like, you know, uh, the United Provinces or England that also definitely had different horizons, like, but these people were in, in front of us, this free land knew evidently that had Vienna fallen the first to be swarmed, um, I mean the first lands to be invaded by the Turks would have been like, yeah, their, their own, northeastern Italy, whatever. Um, so, uh, aside from uh, uh, the Frangipane case, uh, the free land nobility to and for the, the just aforementioned reason were largely present in the Viennese resistance, both in the imperial army, for example, the members of the noble families Porzia Arbatta, um, and uh, the latter was of Tuscan origin, by the way, it was still part of the Holy Roman Empire, though, um, Strasoldo della Torre, etc. And then we have uh, Antonio Varmo di Pers, uh, Bernardino Venier. Ottavio Fenicio, Carlo Maria de Pace, etc. And, and both, um, so these were actually serving into the imperial army, but there were lots of uh, militia, I mean, of volunteers, right? They were not framed under middle, military cater, but were def fighting together with the defenders within the city. And we have, for example, the families of the, um, you know, uh, for example, individual as such as Matteo de, Co de Collalto, uh, that um, the, there is all a documentation about this that has been preserved um, in the castle, for example, of Torre di Pordenone, where that, you know, if you want to go researching there, I mean, you find uh, about the siege of Vienna, there are many archives scattered all over Central Europe, naturally, um, the, depend the Habsburgic dependence, it would be interesting to, to make, for the, I'm sure there is room for a lot of research more. Or especially f about this individual cases, because for the rest, you know, we we don't know with with precision much about. But well, these stories are not so different from medieval times uh, in level of documentation in certain cases. But um, so here, the great story of the siege is intertwined with a, in fact, a lot of other different m micro historical tracks. We could say some of which are true and proper small. Uh, romances, right? And uh, the Italian cases are, as we were saying before, many. Uh, we think, for example, at the case of the uh, uh, noble gentleman from Crema, Gian Battista Benvenuti, who was obliged to move from Lombardy in spite of the protection of Cardinal Ottoboni because he had um, the uh, basically participated to a duel and eventually had killed a priest um, or better one of his servants had killed a priest but of, of whom he uh, you know of which he was suspected as the uh, let's say mandant and um, so he had to abandon Italy and he wanted to disappear from there he ended up in Vienna where Eventually, um, after a letter of General Rabata, he would have fought in the unit of Colonel Heisler, uh, the same one of Prince Eugene hmm, uh, at the time, if you remember the series. Um, and um, among the friends that he remembers in his letters, there are many Italian volunteers, such as the Count Antonio Premoli, the Marquises Geronimo Trenc uh, uh, from Cremona, Guerrieri of Mantua, Cusani from uh, Milan, and who, after the victory, would have, by the way, the latter, uh, entered in possession of objects of great value sacked from the, uh, you know, the, the retinue of the Grand Vizier. And also the Cardinal of Toboni would have rece received from the Benvenuti a very attentive account of things uh, that were happening in Vienna, and he would have uh, epistolarly very much thanked him for that. So you see here basically an intertwining of, you know, of participations that were still at the time vol voluntary, right? They were still basically 
founded on the idea of you know of, of a participation which was somewhat due for, for some that you know others would have you know more shady reasons etc but that would still bring to to make number to make and it, this is all connected to to clientele uh, bonds and uh, favors etc but also as we've seen here that the chance of, of actual earn uh, etc so it's really uh, an endless series of of episodes of figures of stories that are definitely very interesting to to discuss but also uh, at this point we finish here we will keep talking about the development of the siege um, we made actually also already a video on that. Uh, you can find the stuff in modern in the modern warfare playlist. Yes, you, there's plenty of that. You you find this repeated topics here and there next to the others. Um, but the siege of Vienna is definitely um, the 1683 one. Well, we'll talk about we will talk about the the 16th century one telling the truth as well because that in there are also dramatically beautiful. Uh, stories to tell um, but uh, for now we st really stop here um, and I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye